you know, Martin Luther King didn't start his famous speech by saying, I have a nightmare. He told us what the dream was. So I want Sea Legacy to be that vision of the future of where we can go if we actually take the steps that are needed. Because if you can visualize the future, if you can imagine a planet where there's a living ocean and there's wildlife everywhere, then we can make it happen. Hey there. Thanks for joining for another episode of Impact in the 21st Century, a podcast by Simbi Foundation, which celebrates the impactful work being done around the globe and shares the stories of the inspiring individuals who are behind it. My name is Aaron, and I'm the host of Impact in the 21st Century. In this series, we're focusing on the people working to protect our natural world, innovate greener technologies, and ensure that no one's left behind in the process. In each episode, I'll be speaking with an impactful author, founder, activist, or changemaker about the actions they're taking in this space. And in doing so, I also aim to tease out what we can all be doing to lead more impactful lives. But before we get into today's episode, let me tell you about something I'm deeply passionate about, Simbi Foundation, a nonprofit organization working in collaboration with the United Nations to enhance access to education and refugee settlements in Uganda. Simbi Foundation builds bright boxes, solar powered classrooms built from shipping containers that provide educational technology, digital learning material, and sustainable energy through a microgrid to entire schools and communities. If you'd like to learn more, feel free to visit simbifoundation.org. And if you'd like to support Simbi Foundation and our podcast, we welcome you to like and subscribe to help more people discover the podcast. Today, I'm joined by Christina Mittermeier, co-founder of Sea Legacy, an NGO working to create healthy and abundant oceans for us and for the planet. Christina is also a highly accomplished marine biologist, ocean activist, and a true pioneer in the field of conservation photography. Christina, thanks for joining. How are you doing today? I, I love that introduction. I'm doing great there, and thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> we came up with it ourselves. <laughs> and so, Christina, I understand you're joining from Nanaimo today. Yeah, I'm just north of Nanaimo in Nanus Bay on the beautiful coast of British Columbia, a place that I call home. Okay. I have quite a few questions for you about some of the work that Sea Legacy is doing and uh, northern BC, so I look forward to getting into that. Okay. So I know you're born in Mexico, but when did you move to Nanaimo? I got divorced from an American mm-hmm. in 2010, and I met Paul Nicklin, and I he he lived in Whitehorse, and so I visited him, and I realized that the fashions were parka and mock boots, and I said no. So we decided to cut it in the middle, and we landed in Vancouver Island. So so you and Paul live together in. Uh... So we bought this house in 2011. 2012, I forget. So we've been in this house for a long time. Okay. And I'm becoming Canadian this year, so I'm getting my citizenship. I'm very excited. Congratulations. Yeah. So you've been working in conservation photography for 25 years, but how do you go from biochemical engineering and marine sciences to co-founding Sea Legacy, one of the most impactful organizations preserving the oceans, if not the most at this stage? Well, thank you, Aaron. You know, it all starts with this incredible desire to do something for the planet we love, those of us who see the urgency to protect it. And I've always had it. You know, I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't care and when I wasn't aware. Like, I've always known that you cannot fish the oceans the way we do and expect them to be okay. Uh, I mean, I remember knowing about climate change and being horrified 20 years ago before you know, when people were still questioning if it was a thing. So for me, I started uh, the career as a biochemical engineer because it was the only thing in Mexico that I could do at the time. We had the sustainability, environmental sciences, all that stuff didn't exist. And I realized pretty soon that science is an incredibly important tool and we need a lot of science to understand our planet. It's like we're flying a spaceship and we don't even know how to operate it. So science is the instruction manual, really. But that's not how you communicate to people. Most people are um, not versed well in the language of science. It's so unemotional and it's so difficult to connect. So I stumbled upon photography really by accident. I realized that people look at photographs, you know, and they really look and they feel comfortable enough to actually ask you something about the photograph. And that is the beginning of a dialogue that I think is the starting point. And so... 
you realized that photography would be the medium with which you wanted to communicate it. At what point, how did that become clear to you? <laughs> so, I mean, so many people say, yeah, I think photography is the thing. I'm going to become a photographer. I think I was lucky because it actually turned out that I have some artistic talent. And so um, it was the beginning of a very long journey of becoming good at your craft. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, the first few years, honestly, not even knowing how to operate a camera and all the conversation around the ISO and the F-stop was like Chinese to me. But it takes time and it is a long journey. And little by little, you know, you just start overcoming because photography is like learning another language, you know. If, you, if you've ever attempted Spanish, you learn a few words and then you can ask for una cerveza and then you can put together a little sentence and start understanding. And one day, you know, if you practice enough, you'll speak poetry. Mm -hmm. And that's what I uh, have experienced in my photography, you know, over many, many years of learning you start speaking a language that speaks to people. Right. And what is your camera of choice, by the way? Uh, you know, the, whatever camera I happen to be nearby, but mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I happen to be sponsored by Sony and uh, not wanting to use my valuable dollars on equipment, I'll take their cameras and <laughs> not use them. And they happen to be pretty good. I happen to be the best in the market, so it suits me just fine. I've actually seen a few of your Sony talks. They're fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, the truth of the matter is I've enjoyed working with Sony so much. I'm on my 13th year of uh, ambassadorship with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came to Sony when their cameras were just beginning and people were laughing, you know, like, oh, my God, Sony, they have no business in the camera business. Uh, but it's one of those things, you know, leap of faith. And a few years later, they own the market. Yeah, they do. They, their mirrorless cameras are amazing. They anyway, that's enough answers. of the Sony plug for now. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I do love Sony. <laughs> so you, you you develop this craft, and at some point in 2014, you realize that there's an opportunity to, to tailor this craft and to communicate to people about this thin blue line or what's behind it. I think we take a step back. Uh, so in 2004, 10 years earlier, I was working for Conservation International, which is one of the very large conservation foundations. And these uh, organizations are big bureaucracies, you know, a thousand people. And I was working for their communications department and advocating for the use of professional photographs because the communications budgets were so small that the expectation was that whoever happened to go and visit the project, you know, could just snap a couple of pictures with a little point and shoot and show us what a mangrove looked like. And I was thinking, you know, in order to stop people in their tracks, they need to be fascinated by what they're looking at. We need professional photographs. And I started, you know, taking my own photographs and, and using them for that purpose and attending conferences and realizing that there was a universe of nature photographers out there that were going out, you know, many of them really concerned about the places where they were photographing and the animals they were photographing, mm -hmm. and they didn't have a place to insert themselves into the conservation community. So I created the International League of Conservation Photographers, basically to pair photographers with conservation issues. And it became an amazing organization that is still doing great work today with over 100 photographers all over the world uh, working on conservation issues. So that was the preamble. And through that process, I uh, became more, more and more and more closely associated with National Geographic. Mm -hmm. uh, I lived in Washington, D.C. I was able to participate in all sorts of incredible experiences and opportunities with Nat Geo and eventually became a representative photographer by their National Geographic photo agency. And that's how I met Paul Nicklin. And when I met Paul, um, and he already was such a, an established photographer, he already had an incredible career doing something that nobody else was doing, which was telling the story of the polar ecosystems. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated by his work. And... Um, you know, Paul and I met and eventually we both got divorced and eventually we became a couple. And I had to make a decision and follow this man into Canada. And so I left Washington, D.C. and rode across the country and moved to Nanus Bay, to Nanaimo. <laughs> <laughs> and I left the International League of Conservation Photographers. I resigned as, as the president. And the first six months after I resigned, I felt like I had lost my voice 
that the microphone that I had carved for myself to talk about these things that I'm so passionate about had gone away. And and so I remember Paul and I working on assignment for National Geographic on stories that were really, really hard hitting. I don't know if you remember uh, the blob that when the Pacific Northwest became, the water became so warm that thousands of sea lions were dead and orcas were dying and, you know, sea otters were uh, intoxicated with paralytic shellfish poisoning. I mean, it was just horrible. Mm -hmm. And Paul and I talked about it and we said, we, we have to do more with our stories. It cannot just be about publishing in a magazine. And so it was in this room, in this basement, that we decided to start a nonprofit. And I told Paul, you know, you will never do anything as hard as starting a nonprofit. And he mm -hmm. was so naive and he was so celebrated at National Geographic. He thought that people were just going to give us money to go and tell stories. <laughs> and that's not how nonprofits work. So it took us many years to actually craft the narrative, the story. Why are stories so important? Why do you need stories to move the conservation needle? If you want people to care, they need to understand what is happening. And you have to do it in a way that's engaging and fun. It's a call to adventure. And it was at the time, Aaron, when social media was starting. So in 2012 was when Instagram first came out and we right. both did our first picture. And Paul has this thing where he's a little OCD and he's a little bit of a math genius. And he became obsessed, you know, with every post that he put on National Geographic's main account. He could see his numbers growing. And we both started accumulating this massive audience following our stories. And it was almost an addiction, you know, to see that you have 100,000 people care about what I'm saying. And we saw it as an opportunity to grow an audience of people who really care about this topic. At the very least, they care about the stories and about the photography. And that was the birth of Sea Legacy in 2014. You know, I want to get into Sea Legacy, but you've pushed me into an area of social media that I, that I actually want to dive into for a moment. Mm -hmm. So the two of you together, I think, have over 10 million followers on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we often talk about and hear the, the negative implications of, of Instagram and, and social media usage. And I'm wondering, one, how social media plays into your life, but two, how you are actually making social media more impactful. I would imagine that you have some struggle with, with these applications, and I'd love to hear just how you think about them. A huge struggle, but here's the thing. When social media started picking up steam and we were able to amass this large audience, it was very exciting because for the first time, I didn't have to go into Washington, D.C. at National Geographic and beg the editor to publish my story. I could just publish it myself, you know, and I could have a conversation with the people that were, that were looking at my photographs and, and talk about these things. I thought Instagram was the best thing that ever happened. And then, of course, it became corrupted by humans, as it is. And today, we don't own the algorithm. I don't decide who sees my stories or who reads them, you know, and I cannot contact the people that follow me at will, as I thought I would be able to do. So to remedy that, uh, we built a digital tool inside Sea Legacy called Only One, which is an action-taking platform. And the goal is to move the people that care from Instagram and Facebook into our own ecosystem where I can contact you again. Where if I know that you care about penguins, I can send you an email and say, would you do something for mangroves or for octopuses or whatever it is? Mm. And so we have about a million emails of people who care. And it is what you do with those emails that really matters. And so finding the pieces of legislation that we can move with public opinion, finding the politicians who need the public support to create protection or whatever, that's what Sea Legacy does today. Right. And yeah, so it, to answer your question, you know, if I could stop doing Instagram tomorrow because I knew that my whole audience was going to move with me to mm -hmm. only one, oh God, I would stop. Well, hopefully we can get you to a place that that can happen. You know, that's, that's the goal. I, I really, I think it really has been, uh, it became a place where people sell stuff now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I saw your piece with Alex Honnold, which was brilliant. And Alex is right. Instagram can rob you of hours of your life scrolling down to see cats dancing and you know it's just like oh god what am i doing i want to be one of the good instagram people 
<laughs> well, fortunately, you are right. For, fortunately, you are supporting us in the those who are using Instagram are able to actually get meaningful and impactful content. So on one hand, we'd hate to see you go because then there's just fewer, there's just less good content. But at the same time, it makes sense that you would want to get out of it. And, and on that note, I guess the question I have is for other people, for our listeners who are wondering about promoting their own impactful causes on social media, any lessons learned and any, any advice you'd share? Yes, I mean, there's a couple of ways that you can do this, and, and I think we're seeing them on real time. I admire enormously what Sea Shepherd does and what Sea Spiracy do, but they really are leaning on, on a narrative of our planet that is full of gloom and doom. And I find that, that those, those prophecies are self-fulfilling mm -hmm. and they're terrifying. And so I choose as our narrative one that is completely opposite. I, I, you know, Martin Luther King didn't start his famous speech by saying, I have a nightmare. He told us what the dream was. So I want Sea Legacy to be that vision of the future of where we can go if we actually take the steps that are needed. Because if you can visualize the future, if you can imagine a planet where there's a living ocean and there's wildlife everywhere, then we can make it happen. Let's get into Sea Legacy because it is so inspiring what you're doing. So the, the first question I have, uh, and I'm so excited to get into your three-pronged approach because it's awesome. But the first question I have is you and Paul are sitting down in your basement mm -hmm. and you go from idea to fruition. To, tell me about that process. It was very funny. I mean, Paul really had no idea of what, how a nonprofit worked. Uh, we were living in Canada, so we could not really apply for for, uh, for nonprofit status in the United States. You know, we applied here in Canada back with the former administration. Um, what was his name? Our conservative prime minister. Uh, Harper. Harper. Of course, we got denied. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I said to Paul, you know, fine, fine. We will not be a nonprofit. That way we can say whatever we want to say. And that's how we started. And the first name that we came up with was Sea Change. You know, that was the name of the organization. And I, we were going to pitch something. Oh, I remember uh, Prince Albert of Monaco was hosting this big event. And it was time for us to submit a letter or whatever. And I went to Google and I Googled Sea Change. And I found that no, I mean, not only are there like 20 other organizations called Sea Change. Sylvia Earle has written a book called Sea Change. There's a boat called Sea Change. And I said to Paul, this is not going to work out. We need a different name. So at the time, we had an administrative assistant, a young man from British Columbia. His name was Miles Legacy, or is Miles Legacy. He's still alive. Mm -hmm. And he was sitting here, and he said, how about Sea Legacy? <laughs> and I said, sure. You know, you Google it. Nobody else has that name. <laughs> and guess what? The mission is in the name. <laughs> so thank you, Miles. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so you have this idea, you bring on Miles, and... Who were, let's say, the first five hires? Um, we we struggled a lot for the first uh, three or four years because we really didn't understand what we were doing. We knew that stories were important. We knew that building our own audience on Instagram was amazing to have our own distribution channel. Back then, Paul was not even doing video. We were not even creating films. You know, it was all still photography. And so you see, we we had access to billionaires you know people you're a photographer with national geographic people invite you to important dinners mm -hmm. and there you are sitting with people like ray dalio and he says so tell me about sea legacy and you're like well we tell stories and we post them on instagram you know can you give us money <laughs> the answer is no so it took us a long time to actually articulate an organization where um it really is about funneling people to a utility that is that we are building to serve the entire ocean conservation sector. So the top of the funnel is Instagram. It's the adventure. You know, we're hoping that as people are scrolling and looking at cats dancing, they'll come on one of our pictures. You know, they'll say, oh my God, what is this? I love whales. You know, let me see. Oh my God, see legacy. Follow, hopefully go down the funnel to become mm -hmm. members of our community. And, and so now that community is a million emails strong. We are deploying those people on really important campaigns. We have a very robust uh, number of campaigns every year that we peg to a scientific framework for how do we restore uh, health and abundance to the ocean. And it is working. 
And so I don't peddle hopelessness because I don't feel hopeless. I actually feel quite, quite hopeful. And, you know, maybe I'm privy to conversations that are happening that most people are not, but I can assure you, Aaron, that the world is thinking about this, that corporations and governments are looking for the solutions, and I want to be part of that future. So beautiful to hear, and very beautifully said. Christina, tell me about your three-pronged approach of expeditions, campaigns, and solutions, and how, how they all funnel together. Yeah, you know, when I was a little girl, um, I lived in the mountains of central Mexico, and my fascination with the ocean started with Jacques Cousteau, like so many people. Mm -hmm. Um, my father came home for lunch and he had a newspaper package, you know, and he had uh, a couple of books. I, my sisters and I got a book. It was, um, you know, you, you would cut the little dolls and then the little dresses and put them on, color them. My brother, he got Jacques Cousteau, The Living Sea. And I was like, oh, you know, that was the book I wanted. And I couldn't believe that my father had not given it to me. And so I would sneak into his bedroom and I would read it. And I still have that book. I found it the other day. It's... That's awesome. <laughs> so Jack Gusto, you know, invited us all on adventure to explore our, our part of our, our planet that we had never seen before. And um, he did it not just with story, but with the invitation of going on the Calypso. You know, this marvelous ship. And so Bo and I have always known that uh, being expedition photographers has this allure and this magic that attracts people. And so that's why we bought Sea Legacy One. You know, it's that the boat belongs to Paul and to me. We didn't buy it with Sea Legacy money. We put our own pennies into the boat because we want it to be a beacon of hope. Wherever the orange sails of Sea Legacy go, we want people to go, oh my God, they're here to help. Mm -hmm. And so um, the expedition is really important. It's a way of inviting new people into the conversation, making it fun, keeping it inspirational and light and informational, educational. The campaigns, we don't own them. They belong to our, our partners on the ground. And so we partner with over 100 conservation organizations around the world. What they have is they have boots on the ground and they are the people moving the legislation. So small groups in Costa Rica or in Alaska or wherever it is, they don't have the communications machine that we do. They don't have those thousand emails that we have. And so we deploy our campaign machine, but only one, to get them the, the public pressure, the public support that they need for their campaigns. And, you know, the other aspect of it, so we do two types of campaigns. Some of them are advocacy, but the other ones are crowdfunding. And we raise a lot of money. And our, our promise is that that money will go to frontline conservation efforts. So it will go to restore coral reefs in Morea with the coral gardeners, or it will go to protect sea turtles in Costa Rica. And through our expeditions, we tell the story. You know, I want you to know what I did with your $5. And so I'll show you the impact that you're having. And hopefully you'll be inspired to say, Something like, you know what, I gave five, I'm going to give a hundred because this is my planet and this is my future. Understood. And so the solutions are led by the partners that you have on the ground. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, Aaron, I read a, a scientific paper and it was the title that caught my attention. It's called Rebuilding Marine Life, How to Restore Health and Abundance to the Ocean in a Single Generation. Hmm. And I, I didn't even know it was possible. So it's about 20 scientists, some of them uh, people that I know well, and they came up with uh, what they call six recovery wedges. So uh, they said, we have to protect more of the ocean. We need more MPAs, more marine protected areas. We need to protect more species. So we need to stop fishing sharks and we need to stop killing whales. We need to restore habitats that have been degraded, like mangroves and coral reefs. Mm -hmm. We need to stop the flow of pollution into the ocean. And that's not just plastic, it's fossil fuels, it's carbon, it's all of these things that are going into the ocean. We need to rethink fisheries. You know, the way that we harvest food from the ocean is sick. You know, we're not fishing, we're mining. And what we're doing is we're taking out the blue natural capital out of the ocean. And the most important one is we need to recast the ocean as a solution to climate change. And if we do all of those six things and we do it at the same time, we have a crack at restoring the health and abundance of the biggest machine that we have for decarbonizing our atmosphere. 
And so those became the six things that Sea Legacy really focuses on. Yeah, and, and those are not public facing, you know, but that, we do campaigns on plastic. We, we are doing a massive campaign on salmon. Mm-hmm. We do campaigns on, uh, you know, coral restoration and mangrove. I mean, you have to, when, when it's public facing, you have to present it in a different way mm-hmm. um, to counter the narrative of anxiety and guilt that our users are experiencing. You know, you want people to feel empowered. You want them to feel like they have agency, like they're part of something really positive and impactful. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, when I hear about uh, salmon harvesting uh, or, or salmon farming, it's often communicated as a really effective way to produce lots of salmon at a relatively low cost with minimal environmental degradation. Now you dig deeper and you realize, well, that's not true at all. But I understand that you and Sea Legacy are doing some very important work in Northern BC. And I'd love you to to share about that. And also if you could explain how that work works in the context of the expeditions, campaigns and solutions model, I'd I'd love to understand it. Yeah, you know, because British Columbia is our home and it's a place that we love. we felt that it's always important that we have a foot here and that we work here. Mm-hmm. When I first moved to British Columbia in 2012, even though I'm an educated person and I travel the world, I didn't know, Aaron, that we still have living, breathing, vibrant indigenous people that live on this coast, that have their own language, their own traditions. And the thread that holds it all together is this iconic species called salmon. You know, we have actually five types of salmon, but this is a fish that is so important for every single one of the First Nations. And for us as British Columbians, all of us, you know, it's part of the culture here. And I didn't know that, you know, while salmon migrated from the rivers to the ocean and then they came back, I remember when I first saw it, the return of the salmon into one of the streams up in the Great Bear Rainforest. And as somebody coming from Mexico, which is a country where hunger and poverty are a constant idea, you know, I thought, oh my God, you have a fish that predictably comes back to the same river. You know where it's going to show up, you know, in huge numbers. It's, it's like a miracle. Mm-hmm. And we are, we are squandering that miracle. Because fish farms, they seem like a very good solution, you know, and, and, and mind you, you know, when you look at places like Alaska, where they're not farming fish, the returns of the wild salmon are enough to feed so many people mm-hmm. if you just protect it. But here, I mean, I, I would love, love to go back in history to figure out who was the premier, who was the prime minister that thought that allowing these Norwegian companies to come into British Columbia's waters and pollute this pristine environment with these fish that doesn't belong and if you ever had an opportunity to, to dive underneath one of these pens where they keep the fish, it's like a, a rain of poo, you know, of these fish that are congregated. It's like a feedlot in the ocean. Mm. And any animal that lives confined in a small space in huge numbers is a breeding ground for parasites and viruses and, you know, bacteria. It's horrible. Mm. To me, the worst part of it all, the First Nations that depend on the return of the salmon have been, by colonial forces, forced to adopt the farming industry as their main source of income. So in many places, like if you go to Clem 2, the only job available to them is the salmon farm, the farm salmon processing plant, which is it's like, it's like the most cruel form of cultural genocide, honestly. So I'm on a crusade to uh, try to convince people that eating that fish that comes from a farm is devastating for the ocean and to our health. Mm -hmm. And if you have to eat salmon, because yes, it's good for you, you know, eat wild salmon. Mm -hmm. And the one other question I have for you on the, on the factory farm salmon is, so not only are they actually negatively impacting the environment because of the amount of pollution that comes out of it, but these these salmon have the tendency to they can get out of these cages and then they disrupt local ecosystems as well. Is that correct? That's correct. So these these are Atlantic salmon. So they come from Norway, from the other mm-hmm. side of the ocean. And when they escape from the pens, they could inter interbreed with a with a local salmon mm-hmm. and you know mix their genes there and they wreak havoc. Because think about this: salmon are the super athletes of the ocean. 
They're born in the river, tiny little fish. They have to swim out of fresh water. They go out into the open ocean and have an enormous adventure. You know, some species one year, other species four years, and then they come back. And by the time they come back, they're these big silvery athletic fish. Then they have to climb up the mountain, up the stream to go and spawn wherever they spawn. Sometimes, you know, I've seen them in the Yukon, a thousand miles inland, you know, where they've traveled on these streams. They're like super athletes. Mm -hmm. When you see their flesh on, in the supermarket, you know, it'll be this color and, and it will have no fat. Mm -hmm. You see the flesh of a, of a fish that grew up in a farm and it's been swimming around like a zombie its entire life and it's full of fat, it's full of mercury, it's, you know, it, it's gross. Mm -hmm. And you know what the worst part is, Aaron? Those farms... They don't even belong to British Columbians. They belong to Norwegian corporations. All that money leaves the province and goes to Europe. <laughs> so, so, so what is Sea Legacy actually doing about it? Uh, or What's taking place now? So a couple of and things. What, and what can we as Canadians do to support? Yeah, so a couple of things. You know, first of all is education. I think my favorite reaction is I had no idea. And the second one is what can I do? Mm -hmm. and so... In British Columbia, we have a unique moment in history where um, the, the Minister of Fisheries has actually pledged, you know, to follow the recommendation of our prime minister who said, you know, these farms are bad. We need to take them out of the ocean and put them on land. Come June, their licenses to operate in British Columbian waters will expire. And the current minister has to make a decision. Will she extend the the, the licenses or will she cancel them and kick them out? And I think we can deploy our million very loyal <laughs> ocean warriors to sign a petition that supports the decision to, to end the licenses of these farms. Now, okay. what are the First Nations going to do for livelihood? I think at the same time, we need to start supporting uh, alternative industries. Like there's incredible opportunity now with seaweed farming indigenous owned seaweed farms happening already in Tofino. You know, what if every community up and down the coast was, you know, planting seaweed? You would only, you would not only be creating an industry that belongs to the people, but you would also be contributing to, you know, retrieving carbon from the atmosphere. It's like such a win-win. And it sounds like it. So what can I do right now or in the next month to support mm -hmm. this petition? You can go to only.one and mm -hmm. sign your name, become part of our community. You know, I promise you, we will never sell your data. And you, you will get, you know, regular updates saying this is what's happening and this is how you can create change. And by the way, look at this. We kicked ass with this campaign and we won here and you changed that. And, you know, you need to know that the three minutes that you took to donate or to sign actually has an impact. Mm -hmm. Just yesterday, you know, we finally helped ban drift nets in the United States. Five-year campaign. I've been following this one. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, but it's not just us, right? It's a, a co coalition of organizations all working together. But we have those emails and, and we can deploy the support. Right. And, and with Sea Legacy, you're, you're aiming to tell the story of what's beneath the, the thin blue line. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering... When you think about industrial fish farming, do you think that if it wasn't below this thin blue line, do you think that it would be able to have continued the, the way that it has for this long? Do you mean if the farms were on land? Meaning, yeah, if people had visibility into what was actually happening. Oh, yeah, totally. Here's the interesting thing, Erin. So when I was a biochemical engineer in Mexico, I actually specialized on fisheries and aquaculture. I actually know how to do this. Okay. <laughs> We have known, I mean, I graduated university in 1989, and even back then, we know how to grow fish on land. We know the whole process of creating the, the conditions to grow a healthy piece of protein without polluting the ocean. But guess what? It costs money for the infrastructure. It's a lot cheaper to just saddle Mother Nature with the pens in the ocean, you know, and pretend that they're not polluting. So I do hope that the minister uh, will revoke those licenses. And I do hope that the industry is forced to make the infrastructure investment to create a product that's clean and sustainable. Understood. I mean, they should be forced. I mean, they have a ton of money. And, and so... Apart from that campaign, are, are there any other campaigns that are taking place right now that you're particularly excited about? I, I'm, I'm so excited by a number of them. Uh, 
we are going to continue pushing for the protection of sharks in various countries because sharks get such a bad rap and they're so, so important for the health of the ecosystem. So we have a number of petitions in Costa Rica, Ecuador, you know, if, if, if you if you just tell politicians what to do and you congratulate them for doing a good job, you know, they do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Ecuador is about to announce 13 full protection for species, 13 species fully protected. You're not allowed to hunt them, kill them, own them, market them, commercialize them. You know, that, that's huge. We're hoping that by promote, promoting and celebrating that, we can get other countries to do the same. We are going to be pushing a very large petition to get the United Nations to come up with a global framework for plastics. Mm-hmm. We are producing more plastics now than ever. And, you know, it, it needs to be a global push to, to do something about this. And um, I don't think that picking up the plastic on the beach does enough. I don't think that educating people does enough. I think it's the corporations that are producing the plastic that are the problem. Have you ever been to Rwanda? I have been to Rwanda. And you know how they've banned plas- uh, single-use plastics for over 15 years. Yeah, and if and you it works perfectly. In plastic in the country, you are fined thirty thousand dollars. So <laughs> it's a big motivation. I learned that lesson because I had hiking boots on my bag crossing in from Uganda. The hiking boots were in a plastic bag, and they wanted to throw the whole thing out. And I was initially disappointed, and then I realized what what an amazing system they have. Yep, and you know, in in Rwanda, every third Saturday. You know, because I, I, we were driving to see the gorillas and everybody was outside with their the large cleanups. There are large cleanups. Everybody goes out and they clean the front of their street, you know, and it's a massive effort. It's a few hours of your Saturday once a month. And it's amazing. I think it was, it was Paul Kigami wanting to bring the nation together after the genocide, right? Saying That's that right. we'll, we'll clean worked. up together. It worked. Yeah. But if you go to Ghana on mm-hmm. the, on the West coast, you know, I saw dump trucks full of trash you know straight into the ocean right where people are fishing and they eat that fish and you're like god i mean there's a disconnect that's why i asked about rwanda because it it's so striking to me when you cross from from uganda or ghana just how leadership can have such a profound impact so so what could what could we and what could see legacy be doing with the un to to change how things are currently done I think they need to see enormous public support. I, I need to see, they need to see a massive show of people demanding that this happen. We forget that there's a lot of power in the people. You know, you see Greta Thunberg marching out in the streets and a million people follow her, but they have no digital home to continue their activism. We are hoping that only one is going to become that digital home where people can come and become part of an army that's ready to be deployed so that we can speak about the the planet that we want to live in. On the topic of, of visual storytelling, You've got a a really beautiful quote, which reads, visual storytelling is a creative way of bearing witness to history. It allows us to give testimony in the court of public opinion. Our job as a storyteller is to translate what we see into an experience no one can ever forget. And I'm wondering, what made you come up with that quote? What what inspired you to think of it in, in that way? It was um, that quote is probably it goes back to 2005 when we had just created the International League of Conservation Photographers. And this was a new discipline. It didn't exist before. And I was trying to justify the discipline to the photographers themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, I first convened the meeting in 2005 in Anchorage, Alaska at the World Wilderness Congress. And I I was a mom, you know, I was a soccer mom. I, I was you know, I'd never done anything like this. And I sent an email out to like a, a list serve. You remember those? Mm-hmm. And I said, there's going to be a meeting, you know, please come. And people showed up. I had 200 photographers. And on the front line were David Dubelet and Art Wolf and Franz Lanting. I mean, people that I really idolized. Jane Goodall was there, you know. And I was trying to say to them, being a nature photographer is a very passive thing you know you're there to document an animal a flower you know my neighbor is 80 years old she's a nature photographer because she photographs flowers in her yard and then you have people like nick nichols you know who walk across the congo 3,000 miles following the, the the trails of forest elephants 
places that no human had ever gone before, and he photographed the whole experience. And then he showed it to President Bongo of Gabon. And the president went like, oh my God, I have never seen anything so beautiful. He created 13 national parks. I knew there was a difference between being a conservation photographer and a nature photographer. And it was that purpose and that, that action, right? I mean, the pushing the trigger is the easy part, is where you take your images mm -hmm. to bear witness and to testify on behalf of nature who doesn't have a PR agency. And, you know, people have said to me, you're an activist. Hell yeah, I am. <laughs> I am an activist journalist, you know, because if you're not active, you're inactive. And I don't know how to be that, so... I love oh, yeah. that. <laughs> and when when you take that when you're sitting down taking trying to capture the shot do you know the moment that you've captured the perfect shot or or does that happen later on when you're on a computer It's so funny because a lot of the times I do and I can give you an example recently um the the west coast of the Galapagos is such a wild and remote place. The island of Fernandina is where the archipelago was born, born in a volcano. Mm -hmm. And when we actually were there, the volcano erupted, right? But we were able to spend two weeks in a place that nobody else gets to dive. You know, the, the director of the national park said, go take these pictures. They're important. And so we had an opportunity to go and get in the water with marine iguanas, just such an iconic animal. Mm -hmm. And every day, you know, you get in the water with these animals. They're cold until about 10 in the morning. They're basking on land and then they all get in the water and then they start feeding. And, you know, the first day I could see that the iguanas, you know, down under the water, they're cool because they look like Godzilla, but they're not a poetic thing. Mm -hmm. But there was this beautiful yellow seaweed that was dancing in the ocean. And I thought, oh, if I could just get the iguana kind of like wrapped in the seaweed. You know, I can tell a story about blue carbon and this plant that absorbs carbon from the atmosphere and this creature that lives here. And, and so I had it in my head and I really worked for that shot. And when I got it, you go like, hell yeah. And you, you knew you had it. Okay. I, I knew I had it. And sometimes it happens by accident. Uh, mm -hmm. But but yeah, for sure, I, I think a lot about the types of pictures. And, and there's two groups of pictures for me. Some of them are just the storytelling pictures that I know are going to be in the, in the pages of a book or on social media or in a presentation. And then there's the fine art. And, and the fine art is a whole other animal because it's a different way of expressing and of seeing nature. It speaks to me. If I had all the time in the world, I'd be a painter. I look forward to you eventually one day having a little more time so that I can see some of your paintings. <laughs> Maybe one day. You've spent a lot of time with remote and rural communities around the world. Um, and I was watching your TED talk about enoughness. And I was so inspired by the learnings that you had taken from, from the communities that, that you had worked with. And I, I'd love to understand what, what does enoughness mean to you? And, and what, what was the inspiration in, in that, that theme for a TED talk? When, when the, the, the TED talk itself was that kind of like uh, prompted me to think about that idea. I was living in the United States at the time. And even though I grew up in Mexico in a very, you know, non, non-materialistic community, mm -hmm. when I moved to the United States and you start getting marketed the way you do, I, I mean, I was that girl, you know, that I, I needed to go to the shopping mall to just to buy something, anything, you mm -hmm. know? And I was pretty horrified at myself. And, you know, when you start thinking about it, you're like, I mean, what am I trying to solve for here? Am I going to make myself feel better if I buy a new pair of shoes? You know, what, what's the hole inside me that I'm trying to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to make sufficient with stuff, right? And it was in observing these communities that I was spending time with. And I went with a woman to one of these communities, with one of my donors, and her reaction was so shocking to me. Because we walk into the Amazon, this village where, you know, in my mind, these people have everything, you know, they have the river, they have the forest, they don't need a lot of stuff, and they're so content. And this woman, when we arrived, she was like, oh my God, they're so poor. You know, and I was like, poor by whose standards? <laughs> <laughs> they get to speak their language, the children, you know, they don't grow up with this mantra of, you know, I have to make money and I have to be part of this rat race. 
And, and I'm like, oh my God, they have enough. And how do I find that sense in myself? What questions do I need to ask myself to realize that I have enough? And so that I can walk away from that desire to fill my life with shit, you know, mm -hmm. to make myself feel better. And so I, you know, over the years I've thought about it more and it's, it's like a practice. It's like yoga. You have to practice it every day. Mm -hmm. And I take the opportunities, you know, when I go out shopping and you're in the grocery store line and you see all that stuff that's, you know, yelling at you, buy me, buy me, you know, you have to practice enoughness and ask, you know, do I need this? I mean, is this good for the planet? Is this good for me? And just be able to walk away. <laughs> and start filling our lives with the things that really matter the relationships the friendships like meaningful friendships you know let's fill our lives with the pride of where we came from and our country and the uh, cultural icons that mean something our religion if you have it you know the language that you speak i mean all of these things the meaningful work that we do should be enough <laughs> <laughs> we cannot be completed by stuff. So. And so it was your experience in witnessing all these communities that you had you, you realized they're they're practicing enoughness. What how can I emulate it essentially? Pretty much, yeah. you know. I mean, I'm mean, here's this person thinking they're poor, but they're not. They're wealthy. Yeah. They have enough, you know. They may not have all the material stuff, but maybe they don't need it. You know, I remember um, second year at McGill, reading a book in economics, uh, in development economics, called The Original Affluent Society by Marshall Salins. Um, and he goes into the Kalahari Desert and he watches the, the, the villagers and he lives with them for about nine months. Um, and it's the, the chapter is Stone Age Economics. And he ends up essentially concluding that they spend more time with their families they have lower blood pressure, they have more sex than the average British doctor. And he ends up concluding that these villagers lead happier lives from a utility perspective than British doctors in the UK. And I remember reading this and just having such a, I was reading that in conjunction with uh, Walden or Life in the Woods by Henry David Thoreau. And I remember just realizing my entire perspective of the way that the world works is flawed. I think we raise our children we raise them to ask the wrong question. The question is, how do I make money? You know, and when you're growing up, that's the pressure that your parents are putting on you. How are you going to make money? How are you going to make money? You know, and I had to catch myself and not ask that of my children. Instead, say, how are you going to make a life? How are you going to be happy? <laughs> yeah. you know? And I just, I think we're in this rat race of, and a bigger economy is not going to make things better. And this perennial need to grow the economy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just... You know, the, the days that I've started off by thinking, how can I be of service to others mm -hmm. are usually my happiest days. And you're already living in enoughness. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure that I am, but, but I think if, you know, I don't have kids yet, but I'm, I'm inspired by this conversation. And I think if, if instead of asking kids, how are you going to make money? How are you going to help others? You're, you're going to have happier kids. Yeah. And, and how, how are you going to become happy by helping others? You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's even selfishly, you are happier when you help others. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Yeah. You know, and that was the whole thing with conservation photography. Even to this day, you know, photographers ask me, how do I make a career? You know, like if, you, if what you're asking me is how you're going to make money, you're asking me the wrong question. How is your photography going to have purpose? Ask me that. Mm -hmm. So, Christina. Tell me what, what what's next for, for UNC Legacy? What, what are the next, let's say, five to 10 years look like? So this little organization is going to turn 10 years old in a couple of years. I'm really proud of that. I think what's next for us is, I mean, all of a sudden having this clarity that our unique proposition is that we can actually build the audience that needs to be deployed. And so what's next for us is, you know, we need to take our audience from 1 million people to 10 million people. So if you're listening to this, please sign your name to only one and ask a friend, tell your mother. You know, we need we need all the voices. That, that's as simple as that. And so I think I'm going to be dedicating my, my life to that. But the other thing I want to do is I want to work on my photography. 
And I want to put together all the skills that I've accumulated over a 30 year long career where I started making portraits and photographing indigenous people, then became a wildlife photographer, then became an underwater camera woman. I want to tell the story of the people that live on the edge of the ocean, and I want to tell it from the perspective of the water. And it's a difficult story to tell, you know, because the ocean and humans are, <laughs> humans are very fragile. And, you know, it's, it's a fragile relationship, but I think it's a beautiful one. And I don't see any other photographer telling that story, so. And is that is that the kind of story that I could be able to watch in the coming years? I hope so, yeah. Yeah, you know, and these days, as I'm getting a little older, I really find myself, you know, I have a hard time extricating my mindset from art, the artistic aspect of it. I just want to make art. I just want to make beautiful photographs um, because they feed my soul. Mm -hmm. It's very selfish. <laughs> well, they feed all of ours as well, so it's not fully selfish. Oh, gosh. <laughs> good, good. Christina, I can't thank you enough for joining today. Your insights into creating a positive impact and the change in today's world have been incredible. If our listeners want to keep up to date with your work or with see Legacy's work, uh, and I'm sure they do, what's the best place that they can visit? A couple of places, and thank you for having me. If you want to follow the stories and if you want to be part of the adventure, head to sealegacy.org and you're going to be able to immerse yourself in fun, interesting, amazing educational content. If you want to take action, then go to only.one and sign up your name, be part of our campaigns, become a, an investor in projects and community growth, uh, be part of the change, lend your voice, tell me what kind of planet you want to live in. Thanks so much. And if you're listening, you'll be able to find links to all of that in the description of this episode. Christina, it's been amazing, really. And for me too, Aaron. Thank you so much. <music> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Impact in the 21st Century by Simbi Foundation. We hope you found listening to it as meaningful as we did. If you enjoyed listening, please consider subscribing to us on whichever platform you're listening from and leave us a review or a comment to let us know your favorite moment. Or feel free to recommend a guest for future episodes. Simbi Foundation builds bright boxes, solar powered classrooms built from shipping containers that provide educational technology, digital learning material, and sustainable energy through a microgrid to entire schools and communities. If you'd like to learn more, feel free to visit simbifoundation.org. Thanks for taking the time to listen, and we look forward to bringing you more stories of positive impact in the next episode.